Yeah, I don't want to scream into this. Yes, it does. Yeah? Okay. So we're going to sing el himno nacional revolucionario de Puerto Rico. Despierta, borinqueño, que han dado la señal. Despierta de ese sueño, que es hora de luchar. A ese llamar patriótico, no arde tu corazón. Ven, no será simpático el ruido del cañón. Nosotros queremos la libertad. Nuestro machete nos la dará. Vámonos, borinqueños, vámonos ya. Que nos espera ansiosa, ansiosa la libertad. La libertad, la libertad, la libertad, la libertad. ¡Que viva Puerto Rico libre y socialista! Gracias, Lillian. We're going to be doing now a short um, presentation, video presentation and then we'll begin the rest of the program. To New York in 1958. Uh, my mother had come maybe two or three years before um, to set up and my sister and I were left in the charge of my paternal family, my grandmother and aunts. I picked us up in, in New York. And um, what was it like? Well, in the beginning, you know, I mean, you know, you're going to New York and they tell you these stories, you're going to find money in the street. Uh, but once I got to New York, it was a little different because it wasn't green, it was cold, uh, and you know I didn't know the language, so it, it was not it was not a pleasant experience. And the 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 language thing was very difficult, you know. And I I you know I I don't know I I guess I was I was very hostile. I was uh, very combative, you know. Um, and I got into a lot of trouble in school the first years, up to about the sixth grade. Time we were going to religious instructions, and I don't know if I was talking in line or out of line. A teacher pulled me to the side. She pulled me out of the line and she slapped me. So I went into a room and I got the big uh, a stick from one of those big brown paper rollers that they used to have in the class. I got the stick and I hit it with the stick. <laughs> one of the other students was choking me while I was hanging my coat and I just went berserk. And, you know, I mean, I was, I was, I went after the kid, you know, and the kid was big. It was a big fat kid. And I went after him and threw him with everything that I could find in the room, basically destroyed the classroom. You know, I attribute that interest in in of, of social struggles and, and politics to my seventh grade teacher, a young African American teacher. Um, he was very young, Margarita Fletcher. Well, this is like 1963, and this is the whole civil rights struggle. I mean, the Kennedy assassination. So all those things that were happening in the South, we were witness to, and we saw it on television, we saw it in the newspapers, and we talked about it in class. And I think that's where my interest in, 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 in history and social struggle started. Uh, well, photography, it, you know, I attribute that to, to my, my father's um, photo album. He had, he had bought a, a photo album from Korea. Uh, and, um, you know, we would sit 
you know, as young kids, we would sit, you know, with my mother and we would look at the album and it was black and white photographs. And I think that's where it started. And then at 13, he gave me a camera. You know, he gave me this little camera here. Well, um, I went to a vocational school. I went to a voc I went to automotive high school in Brooklyn. And back in the day, they had this thing called tracking where they tracked or steered the minorities into non-academic high schools, which are basically trade schools, vocational schools. But then, so then at the end of the year, uh, Mr. Peck, who was our shop teacher, lined us all up. And this was a, you know, it was all male school, you know. So he lined us up and he's, and I fucking remember the words, you know, he said, let's face it, gentlemen, most of you are not college material. And I was like incensed with that, you know? So I was a pretty good student that, you know, that, that year when I graduated, the principal called me, said, we have a job for you, you know, somewhere in a body shop or something. And I told him, well, thank you, but I'm going to college. I applied to Manhattan Community College. Got involved with the student struggle there, the whole question of establishing black and Puerto Rican studies, uh, the whole question of, of the, the um, the Vietnam War, which I was I was active uh, when I was about 16, 17. Um, I was already going to you know demonstrations in Central Park. I'm trying to figure that one out. I think it was you know my relationship with you um, because you know that's a disclaimer. <laughs> Uh, but in the beginning was basically dealing with housing uh, issues. I remember we were trying to organize a, an SRO up on 106th Street between Broadway and Amsterdam. And, uh, you know, then people would come to the office and say, look, we don't have any hot water or heat. And we would go with them to the local management office. And and you know and say listen you gotta you gotta fix this. I left the comité probably about in the middle of 1972, maybe beginning of 73, and I left because I went I went back to school and so you know I left as a, a full time member I guess but I was. I guess a sympathizer because I covered a lot of the, the things, all the, the, the activities that the comité was doing. We were very disciplined in terms of, of like always, you know, being, being um, on point, you know, in terms of being conscious that, that, you know, we could be targeted at any time, you know, and, and I, I mean, at like one time, I mean, they broke into our office and they vandalized the office. It provided me with some more political education, you know, in a more formalized way. Befriended by, you know, a very important person in the photography industry, Sid Kaplan, who, 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 who who's a professional printer and would print for uh, one of the most renowned photographers of technical things about developing photographs. I had a three year scholarship. And I think after about two and a half years, I just walked out the door because I said, I don't need, I don't need a paper to tell me I'm an artist. Uh, but I felt, you know, I had all the tools that I needed to keep doing my photography. The, the American Eugene Smith, who's a, a documentary photographer, um, Edward Weston, those, these are, you know, photographers from, you know, the 40s and 50s that I got to learn through books. I started to look to see if I could find any uh, that were Latino. Um, 
interested in music and what I call popular culture. So I have a lot of street music uh, because I think in terms of our community, the, you know, the Puerto Rican community, uh, those street musicians, though they might not be on a professional stage, they play an important role in our community because they, they're like farmers. They're spreading the seeds of our culture. And if you look through my photographs, I have many different interests, you know. But the, one of the most important things, I think, besides the politics, is the whole question of um, giving visibility to the community in terms of our humanity. And that to combat those negative stereotypes that, that were projected in the 50s or since we got here, even before that, you know, about us being a danger and being a menace. We have people, you know, like my parents who got up every day and went to work. Try to give us the pride, a sense of morals, a sense of what's right and what's wrong. But yeah, so I want to try to combat some of those stereotypes. So that's, that's, that's my goal. I guess it's more of a humanistic, I guess. Before we didn't have all this uh, documentation about all this, uh, you know, these things that happen in our community. I mean, you know, George Floyd. So now it's much more difficult to, to say, well, you know, the person threatened me or whatever, because now there's video, there's people with phones and, and they're filming these encounters. So I, I think it's good. And, and the, you know, the question for young people, you know, it's, it's a commitment, it, it's a commitment you know, to maybe write some of the things that are wrong uh, that we see. It's just a commitment. You know, I mean, I, I, I didn't exhibit for like 25 years. I still kept doing my work because it's something that I love and, and it, you know, it is something I'm very much interested in. Well, that I, that I, I, I try to make a difference. That I, I try to, I did because I, I did community work all my life. I worked in community centers the last 20 years. I worked in a mental health clinic. Doing that kind of work, you can only offer people maybe alternatives. You cannot change people. People have to change themselves. They have to make choices. So, you know, it's it's rewarding. You know, it doesn't, it didn't pay that much, but I didn't do it for the money. <laughs> Welcome, compañeros and compañeras, to the 50th anniversary celebration. The, the <laughs> they, they only see my head. <laughs> to <laughs> to um, the culmination of the 50th anniversary celebration of El Comité MEMS founding. 50 years ago, a group of young men and women from the Upper West Side, as Maximo Colón began to describe in his uh, presentation, began doing housing work because there was a movement called Urban Renewal that was looking to remove working class people from the communities that we had historically inhabited, especially working class people of color. And today you call this gentrification. And today if you go to 88th Street and Columbus Avenue, which is where we had our office, you would never believe that there was once a group of Latino working class youth organizing because it is so gentrified and so outside of our reality. But back then, we took over that office, and we helped the squatters movement that was up there. And as we began to look at why is this happening, what are the reasons behind this kind of situation, we began to do political education. We began to study. We began to have discussions. We began, it became more and more formal. We had with us not just Puerto Ricans, that was the base of our organization, but we had founders who were Dominicans. We had Cubans. We had Panamanians so that we had also the influence of other people and of other perspectives and uh, communities that were similar to ours, but had also gone through their own changes as immigrant communities in this country. From there, as we begin to do this kind of political work, we also begin to understand that it's not just a housing issue. There are other issues happening all over the city. We had the bilingual education struggle in the Lower East Side. 
I was in the Lower East Side, and I became involved in that struggle with other compañeros who lived there and who were members of El Comité. And we began to struggle for community control of the schools, which had started in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, another working class, predominantly African American community. And so we had that struggle happening. We struggled to preserve, to stop the closing of hospitals like Harlem Hospital and to struggle for clinics that were desperately needed in our communities and to stop them from closing. And we struggled for student rights and we struggled for bilingual, uh, for Puerto Rican studies programs. We study, we struggled to keep the schools open, the universities open and affordable to working class children, uh, working class students. We struggled to stop the forced drafting into the war, the Vietnam War of our youth. So there were many things happening at the time. We had a war, a Vietnam War. We had young people from our communities being drafted, young men being drafted and coming back damaged in body and soul with no resources, nothing to help them get over the war and being forced then for communi the communities that were already stretched thin to try to help our own uh, Vietnam veterans. We also then had Vietnam veterans who helped to come back with that outrage, that fire, and helped to create the political organizations like El Comité, like the Black Panthers, like organizations of Mexican Americans, Chicanos, indigenous organizations. Almost every major political organization of that time, especially of communities of color, had Vietnam veterans in there. And that's an aspect that I don't think gets mentioned often of the work that they did in helping to create consciousness around the US as an imperial power and what it was doing to the people of Vietnam and from there what it was doing, doing around the world and who was behind that war. So all of this was happening at that time. At the same time there was a women's movement that was emerging, right? And it they were struggling for, for abortion rights. They had been struggling for uh, birth control and we, the Latinas who were part of that struggle, also began to see that we had to struggle against sterilization abuse that was happening to Puerto Rican women, to African American and indigenous women. And so it wasn't just birth control and abortion rights. In our particular case, it was also sterilization abuse because we learned as part of our history that by that time, 30% of Puerto Rican women of childbearing age had been sterilized. And so, so many things influenced us, so many things fed us, so many things outraged us. And so we deepened our political education. We were influenced by the struggles in Chile. We were influenced by the struggles in Nicaragua. We were influenced by the struggles in Argentina. We were influenced by the struggles of all of these different compañeros and compañeras and liberation movements around Latin America. But we were also influenced by struggles in Africa. We learned about Nelson Mandela in South Africa. We learned about Angola and the MPLA, right? We learned more and more about who the Vietnamese people were and why this war was happening. And we became convinced that these were people that we had to defend and that we had to struggle for and that we had to sustain a movement here in this country to end the war, but also to support the right of the, Vietnam pe the Vietnamese people to develop the society that they wanted. We also uh, did solidarity work with Cuba. Puerto Rico and Cuba had always been close, but now we became close to the Cuban Revolution. We learned about the blockade the, against Cuba. We learned about what the revolution was trying to do in Cuba and bringing about. And so defending the Cuban Revolution became essential also to our work. And throughout it all, from the beginning to the very end, the struggle in support of Puerto Rico's right to independence, the struggle against the colonial nature of Puerto Rico, and exposing what was happening in Puerto Rico. And that was why we were here, understanding that we were here because Puerto Rico is a colony, and that we had to defend Puerto Rico and support the revolutionary forces in Puerto Rico and the mass struggles of Puerto Rico, the struggles of the students of Puerto Rico in the University of Puerto Rico the struggles of people who were struggling for housing rights, people uh, who were struggling against repression in Puerto Rico because every time the people mobilized in Puerto Rico, the state would come down with massive repression over there. At the same time, we were struggling to liberate our political prisoners, Lolita Lebron, Rafael Cancel Miranda, 
Irving Flores, Andres Figueroa Cordero, Oscar Collazo. They have been in prison since 1950 in the case of Oscar Collazo and the other four since 1954. And so we struggled to get them out of jail. And that in itself was a major education because not only did we learn about the Puerto Rican comrades, we learned about the Black Panther comrades who have been imprisoned and to this day, 44 years later, are still in prison. We learned about Leonard Peltier, indigenous comrade, who to this day is still in prison. So these were the things that outraged us, that fueled us, that informed us, that educated us, that motivated us, that inspired us. And so today, we celebrate that history with a photographic exhibit that Maximo Colón prepared and that shows not just the specifics of El Comité, but more so the era of El Comité, MIMP, the era that we were in, the different communities and what was happening in those communities and the ways in which those communities were struggling, but also what was happening there in terms of the impoverishment of those communities, the devastation of those communities. That is what this exhibit, we hope, will give you a taste of our work, but a taste also of that era. I want to end by saying, El Comité MIMP is no longer around. We lasted for about 12 years. Like many groups, we had internal issues, but we were not the only ones. It was an era where there were different issues everywhere. The Young Lords were no longer around. PSP was having issues. We had, you know, within the white left, there were different issues. We had participated to the event that, to the extent that we could in trying to build a revolutionary movement in this country. But we were also up against powerful forces, powerful forces. And so El Comité MIMP eventually ceased to exist as a political organization. But El Comité MIMP, as a commitment, continues to live in those of us who are still here. We continue to stand for Puerto Rico. We continue to demand, we continue to be outraged by the fact that Puerto Rico is a colony of this country. And we continue to march and defend the right of Puerto Rico to be free. We continue to be outraged by the political prisoners that I just mentioned earlier, and the fact that they're still in prison, and we continue to fight and demand their freedom. We are still outraged by the fact that they try to legislate our wombs as women, as we are seeing in Texas. It outraged us then, it continues to outrage us today. We are outraged by what is happening with immigrants in this country and the caging of children, right? And the deportation of Haitian, of the Haitian people. We are outraged by the terrible, terrible destruction of our earth that is putting in danger the future of humanity all over the world, in this country and all over the world. We are outraged and continue to be outraged by the racism and police brutality that continues to be used against people of color, particularly the African-American community. At the same time, we feel, uh, we feel gratified and inspired by the young people that are out there today with new tactics of struggle with new forms of struggle, new ways of mobilizing us, of fueling us, and telling us we need to continue struggle, to struggle. The struggle has not ended. And though some of us no longer can, be as, can move as quickly as we once did, right? We can't move as fast as we once did. We can't always be at every demo. We can't always be at every event. But we continue to make every effort to be presente. We continue to be presente in whatever way we can. If we're not a demo, then surely we're going on Zoom to find out what's happening around the world. We're digging into our pockets, our retirement pockets, and saying, here, I support the struggle, right? We are signing petitions that are put before us, denouncing or supporting something or the other. We are determined still to alert and demand and denounce uh, elected officials that are not representing the interests of our communities. So we have not gone away. We've gotten older, our hairs are grayer, but we have not gone away. And we will not go away because that is the legacy of El Comité. It lit a fire in us and that fire has not been put out. 
and we will continue to say presente in every way that we can. I end now, before I introduce Maximo, with a consigna, a slogan that we used back then. In, in English, it's death and war to imperialism. In Spanish, it was guerra y muerte. Guerra y muerte. Guerra y muerte. Thank you so much, compañeros and compañeras. Thank you. I now leave you with Maximo Colón, our photographer, who will explain some of the photos that are up there. Maximo continues to have an eye and a focus and a commitment on documenting, not just El Comité back then, but on documenting whatever struggle is happening here and around the world. Maximo. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Um, Hay mucha historia en esta fotografía, muchas experiencias que tuvimos como organización. Y quiero decir este, enfáticamente que todo esto ¿verdad? fue a base de, de coalitions, ¿verdad? No, no podemos decir que, que nosotros hicimos la revolución. Este, y es muy importante eh, para la gente joven que oigan eso y que aprendan de eso, la cuestión de, you know, mobilize together. And I'm very happy that uh, People's Forum exists because something like this, they, you know, we had something close to it, which was Casa de las Americas back then. And I was here yesterday putting up the show with the rest of the, of the committee. And um, there's this flurry of activity of all young people. It just gives me hope, you know. Um, you know, there were, there were very important things that happened that I got to experience, you know, as a member of a comité. One of the very, one of the first things was when, back in 1972, when I went with Frederico to Puerto Rico to talk to the Nationalist Party on behalf of the organizations here that were advocating for the release of the Nationalist prisoners, which was, you know, PCP, the Carlos Feliciano Defense Committee, Los Estudiantes, I mean, it's a whole series of organizations, Resistencia Puerto Riqueña, and Fred couldn't drive. He didn't know how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was a former Marine, you know, he had a lot of experience, but he couldn't handle a car. So, <laughs> Dominicano. So, I went with him, you know, as a backup and also, you know, chauffeuring him around. And we met with the nationalists. And one of the, uh, the, the photograph is not here, but one of those, the highlights of that trip was meeting uh, Blanca Canales, you know? Uh, and we were, at that time in the early 70s, we were, very, we were very nationalistic. We were like down with Don Pedro and the nationalists, I mean. Este, so we had a lot of experience with that. One of the other things that happened that the pictures you know, talk about was the whole question of how we organize with other people for the creation of realidades. And when we challenged Channel 13 and PBS uh, the, you know, for representation of our community and we said, you receive X amount of public funding yet you have zero programming that represents our community. And again, that was through a whole series of, of people that were involved, you know. Um, and one of the highlights of that was when we were uh, covering the UN back in 72, and we got a chance to try to interview Salvador Allende. And unfortunately, through problems, we couldn't meet with him, but we met with his wife, Hortensia Allende. And we met with her at the Wall of Astoria, and Frederico was part of that interviewing process. And this was for a segment on realidades. So when we left, we were loading up our equipment in, uh, in the Wall of Astoria, in the docking area. I noticed through the revolving door, I see some activity. And I noticed Salvador Allende is coming through the, uh, the revolving door. So right away, you know, I started taking pictures as they were in the revolving door and as they approach, and that's maybe the picture you'll see upstairs, and as they, as they approach, uh, Doña Hortensia said to, to Salvador Allende, he said, mire, uh, Salvador, 
estos son unos compañeros que apoyan la lucha en Chile. So, you know, he came over, we shook hands, and, you know, we said our words. Uh, so that was, you know, that was a, a, a real important moment. And um, it's all, you know, I mean, the, the gains that our community have made have been through struggle. It, it's not because they were, you know, they were given to us because, you know, the powers that be were felt benevolent. They said, oh, let's, let's give them this or let's give them that. It was on the base of struggle. I remember as a, as a young person, you know, 13, 14, and the neighbors would ask my mother if I could go with them to a social service agency so that I could translate. And you could imagine, I mean, I just got here. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I didn't know all the nuances of the language. I'm getting better. <laughs> But anyway, um, you know, the photographs are here. Uh, it's a whole lot of different struggles, and, and it was with a lot of compañeros and compañeras, you know, uh, that this came about. And, you know, I want to remember, you know, Manuel Ortiz, who was a hell of an organizer, Iris, Iris Belgara, este, Noel Colón, he's up in, there's a photograph of him and his, and, his, and his child. Noel Colón was assassinated, was murdered in his office at the Union Hall in Puerto Rico. He was one of our, our comrades at a comité. Uh, Frederico Lora, who recently passed away. Uh, and if I forgot somebody, oh, Nelson, Nelson Gomez Soto. You know, and these, you know, we were a little younger than some of the folks that were in the comité. They were a little older than us. They had a lot more experience, you know. I mean, uh, Lillian and I, and Willie, who's sitting back here, we were all, you know, rebel rousing in Manhattan community. And uh, eventually, we, we migrated to El Comité. So uh, there's a lot of history. And I want to thank at, uh, the People's Forum for hosting you know, the presentation. <laughs> If you can donate, donate. Keep this going, because this is a very important space. And I want to thank you know, my, my compañeros, because las cosas no se hacen sola, you know? Gracias, Maximo. Um, I just have a, a public service announcement. <laughs> We have a book that was written by one of our members, Rose Muzio, Radical Imagination, Radical Humanity, uh, Puerto Rican Political Activism in New York. If you get a chance to please look at this, this will give you more of an in-depth understanding of El Comité from the beginning to the end and goes into more details about some of the struggles that I mentioned and that Maximo mentioned. This exhibit will be up until uh, November 12th. It begins here, and then you have to go upstairs. Um, we're going to have Biting and Kathy will be helping to direct the traffic. The pictures are on both sides of the wall upstairs, and it's a narrow hall. So we ask people to please be careful. That's glass. And so, you know, you might be looking at something, suddenly lean back and hit something behind you. So please be careful. Uh, the traffic will be directed so that you will come back through another exit. Uh, Biting is standing over there, and Kathy Gruber is over here. And so, thank you all. Thank you very much for coming out and supporting us. We'll see you at the next demo. 